the game of life. We've all heard the term before, the game of life, and if you sit down and think about it, it's not too far off from the truth. Every decision you make, every relationship you enter, you have an opening move. And every reaction and action that happens, there's a series and a path that you continue upon, and maybe there's some patterns that you see, maybe patterns you wish not to repeat, and you take another path. This game is such, it, it's so interlinked with why and how we live our lives. It makes me ask the question, why aren't we learning this explicitly as children? How to play the game. There's so many unknowns in this world, what's gonna happen in five years from now, 10 years from now. And it's kind of exciting. I mean, if you think about this statistic, 65% of elementary school students today are gonna to end up in jobs that don't even exist yet. In fact, most of you here between the ages of 16 and 19 are going to be in jobs that don't exist yet. Myself, I went to university and I studied literature and then I went to business. Today I live in Norway, I run a tech startup in chess, and I work with the world chess champion. It's not a path I ever could have fathomed or imagined. And there's more exciting news. Two million jobs are gonna be created between now and 2020 that don't exist yet. But while there's all this excitement around what's coming for the future, we face some big challenges. We face some big challenges because in the US alone, 1.2 million jobs aren't going to be filled in 2018. These jobs aren't going to be filled, not because there aren't enough people, but rather, there aren't enough people with the right skills. The skills I'm talking about are the STEM subjects. Science, technology, engineering, and math. There's a lot of students going into these studies in the academics, and potentially staying in the academic realm. The problem is, not enough people are transitioning into the public and private sector with these skills. Couple that with the fact that 7.1 million jobs are also going to become obsolete. And it's, you know, it's change. It, it does happen. And it's happening because of guys like him. Meet Baxter. Baxter is a brilliant robot. He sits on assembly lines and he does things like packaging and sorting and it's great for companies. I mean, he has no holiday, he doesn't take sick days. But the thing is, is that Baxter is going to displace jobs. So, the question is, how do we get more youth interested in those subjects? The subjects are going to lead to people programming Baxter, updating Baxter, and creating the new version of Baxter. My answer to that, big surprise, it's chess. <laughs> chess. The game that has been played for over 1,500 years. It's an old game and the rules have stayed relatively the same during this time. But the thing about chess is a lot of people think about it as a game for old men. An old men sitting in a park with some pigeons around and playing. But chess is also super powerful. Why I say that is because studies have shown the brain of an average person and the brain of a chess grandmaster are very different. Now let me be clear, it's not that they were born with these brains that were so different, but rather that the chess grandmaster trained his brain with chess in a way that the average brain did not. The thing about chess players, they're using the frontal and parietal cortices of the brain far more often. These are the parts of the brain associated with problem solving and recollection. And it's not a surprise because there's a fact that there's more positions on a chessboard than there are atoms in the entire universe. Think about that. Every grain of sand and every star in the sky in our known universe, there's more chess positions than exist. It's incredible. So it's no wonder that it's working the brain in these ways. It's training things like analysis, problem solving, critical thinking, visualization, IQ, calculation verbal skills, mental acuity, EQ, and memory. Studies since the 1970s have been showing that these skills 
are being trained by playing a game. And chess is great for kids. It's fantastic for kids. In fact, in an inner, inner city school with 70% of the students below the poverty line, 6% increase was found in their standardized test scores after the inception of their chess program. In a John Hopkins study, 1.2 standard deviation for those students that were in a chess program in both math and reading. And a brilliant study out of Bradford High School showed that over a 32-week period in a four-year study, 32 weeks out of the year that students were playing chess, their average test scores went up on average 17.3%. So yeah, chess is great for kids, absolutely. And very, very good for kids between the second and third grade because a lot of development happens during that time. But chess is also a brilliant thing for anybody of any age, including seniors. The National Institute of Health had a study on those uh, seniors that were facing dementia and Alzheimer's. And what they found was that those that were playing chess had what's called cognitive reserve. It's a way that the brain protects itself from injury and damage by being able to operate normally despite going through an injury or some type of trauma. Chess trains this. It helps build this cognitive reserve. The other thing about chess is that it's an equalizer anywhere in the world. No matter your socioeconomic status, your gender, your age, you can play chess. Case in point, I want to introduce you to Fiona. Fiona Mitesi. She's also known as the Queen of Ketwe. Ketwe is one of the poorest slums in Uganda. The story about Fiona is quite a powerful one. She lost her father at the age of three to eight. And around the age of nine, she dropped out of school because she had to help her mother take care of her brother. One of the things that kept her going, though, was her walk every day to a church where they offered her a bowl of porridge. But it wasn't just the bowl of porridge. They offered the bowl of porridge if you came to play chess. Fiona began playing chess. She began beating the other students, including the boys, then her teacher. Fiona went on to becoming one of the greatest champions in Uganda, and she now represents her country at the Chess Olympiad. Fiona brings about some really good points about chess. and It may sound simple, but she says things such as, I like chess because it makes you plan. And without planning, you're going to have a bad life. <laughs> and it's true. Every decision that she's made and every opportunity she's had has come about because of her ability to plan and the fact that she played chess. Chess gave her hope. In fact, chess lifted her out of poverty. She plans today to become a doctor and a grandmaster, and chances are, she'll probably reach those goals. Her story is so inspiring that Disney's actually creating a, a story about her, and there's already a biography written about her. But it doesn't just happen here. It comes a bit closer to my home, too. I want to talk a bit about IS 318. Inner City School 318, Brooklyn, New York. That's the school that had the 70% of the students living under the poverty line. Well, the thing about IS-318 is that they also had a chess program. And that chess program led to a chess team. And IS-318 has the most national championship chess titles in all of the United States in the high school division. Oh, and they're a middle school. <laughs> Pretty incredible. And IS-318 also scores above average in their entire district. In fact, in the math category alone, 94% above the rest of the district. They're also inspiring, so much so that they've created a documentary around them. Their chess team is 80 students, larger than most high school's football teams. And over half of the school plays chess in chess classes. But I want to take the story a little bit further and talk about Rochelle, the girl in the middle there. You see, Rochelle, she was one of the five chess players they followed in this documentary. And in an interview, she was asked, Rochelle, when you were homeless, did you still play chess? And her answer was, yes. Chess is my safe haven. 
Today, Rochelle has gotten a full ride scholarship to Stanford University where she's now studying. And she said that her ultimate goal is to lift her mother out of poverty. She's well on her way to achieving that. Okay, so maybe there's still this idea that the that chess is for old guys, but I think a lot of us, especially in the Nordics, realize it's not. And it has a lot to do with this guy, Magnus Carlsen. Magnus Carlsen, the current world champion of chess, highest rated player of all time, 25 years old. But he's not just a chess player, he's an ambassador. He's a model, he stars in commercials for companies like G-Star and Porsche. He's on Times 100 most influential people in the world because of his influence on chess in this world. Any school you walk into around the world and ask a child who's your favorite chess player if they're in a chess club, they'll likely answer Magnus Carlsen. So, one of the things that Magnus has done and has been along this trend that smart is the, the new cool, it's the new sexy. Nerds are running this world. <laughs> I, I'm not joking, they are. There's a reason why your mother said marry a nerd. <laughs> what it comes down to is that we need more brain power. We need, we need more nerds. So, what it comes down to is joining together and unlocking the power of this game, unlocking the power of chess and making the world a smarter place. Thank you. <laughs>